Hey everybody, and Tony here with a review of Giacomo Merberes Les Huguenots, which I saw last night at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. The conductor was Michele Mariotti, the production was done by David Alden, the sets were done by Giles Cadel, the costumes were done by Constanze Hoffmann, the lights were handled by Adam Silverman, the assistant directors were Teresa Raiba and Gerlinda Pelkowski, the chorus master was Raymond Hughes, the choreographer was Marcel Lehmann, and the dramaturgists were Jörg Königsdorf, and Kurt Rösler. Les Huguenots is yet another one of Giacomo Merber's most famous operas of all time, totally up there with the likes of Robert le Diable, Le Prophète, and L'Africaine. My experience with Les Huguenots was mainly limited to the arias from Marguerite de Valois' virtuoso showpiece, Au beau pays de la Touraine, which then leads up to the cabaletta A c'est tout ce s'anime, Rôle de Nangis, Plus blanche que la blanche hermine, Valentine's Parmi les pleurs, Marseille's Seigneur Rampart et se tient, which then leads up to his main aria, Pif Paf Pouf, the battle song, Urbain's Noble Seigneur Salut, which then leads up to the cavatina, Une Dame Noble Sage, and of course the various duets, including the duet between Raoul and Marguerite, and of course the very popular duet occurring between Raoul and Valentine. So there is just a lot of great arias and numbers found in this opera, but singing each of these is easier said than done, as they are some of the most challenging arias and pieces that any singer would ever dare try out. But I'll get to them later when I talk about the singers. But first, the general plot of the entire opera. Since this is a historical drama, it takes place in 1572 during the St. Bartholomew's Massacre in France, in which the Catholics were trying to rid France of the Protestant influence. Our story begins in the house of the de Saint-Prix, in which Valentine and Le Comte de Nevers are basically engaged, and Raoul enters the scene in which he is sort of reminiscing the time where he was in love with Valentine. He then receives a note from the queen, Marguerite de Valois, to come in blindfolded to her court, mostly because it was mainly involving the affair that Le Comte de Nevers and Valentine has in order for their marriage to happen so that both the Protestants and Catholics can reunite. Raoul enters Marguerite's palace blindfolded and she urges him to push forward with a plan, but Raoul feels that Valentine has betrayed him and he feels that Valentine is the Nevers mistress. So, Valentine is unhappily married to Le Comte de Nevers as her heart still pines for Raoul. Raoul and Valentine meet at her house, and Raoul is torn between his duty as someone who is willing to defend the Protestants and his love for Valentine. Feeling that his duty is a lot more important, he jumps out the window and chases towards the Protestants that are about to be executed, and poor Valentine faints. The opera doesn't really end happily, as Marcel, Valentine, and Raoul are then executed, and Comte de Sambre recognizes that one of the victims he has executed is his own daughter, leading everything to a tragic close. So as you can tell from the story, this does have some elements from yet another opera, but composed by a different French composer, Jacques Fomental à la Vise, La Juive. Now, the similarities between these two operas is that they talk about faith, but they also have a lot of historical context. And in terms of their vocal lines, you even have two heroines who are sung by two completely different sopranos. In Rachel's and Valentine's case, they are given to falcon sopranos or lower voice dramatic sopranos who nonetheless have high notes. And in terms of Eudoxie and Marguerite de Valois, they are given to coloratura sopranos. So the juxtaposition of these two female voices is quite in evidence not only in Juive, but also in Huguenot. So you can definitely tell that this opera has become quite popular at the time and has garnered a lot of really great singers who embodied all of these characters 
and also made some of the Arias their own personal showpieces for their different concerts. With that said, let's get on to what I thought about the production. Overall, it is quite decent in terms of how it was executed, but there were moments in which it looked rather garish, most notably the lighting and some of the sets. And while the lighting was really well done in terms of using different colors, the overall feel of the entire production felt rather garish. But the sets were quite interesting, and they were really nice to look at from time to time. And what I've noticed about the entire production is that they moved the action from 1572 France all the way up to somewhere in like the mid to late 1800s. And it's also evident in the costumes. A lot of the costumes for the men are usually that of uniforms and for the women they're mainly ball gowns and for the girls in the church they're mainly like white dresses and white Mary Janes. So the costumes are actually quite gorgeous to look at. I especially love La Reine Marguerite's costumes, which looked really elegant. And she just looked really fabulous no matter what scene she appears in. What more can you expect? She's the queen. So overall, I do have some mixed feelings with this production. While I'm not a fan of the overall garish tones it uses, I still really like the costumes, which look really elegant and very colorful. And they really fit the singers wonderfully, which is an absolute plus in my book. And now we get to the singers, starting off with Patricia Choffi as La Reine Marguerite de Valois. This role is quite challenging for any coloratura soprano who attempts this role, much like her predecessors being Constanze and the Queen of the Night and even Lucia Ashton, Marguerite de Valois really calls for a true dramatic coloratura soprano who can sing all of the high notes in such an agile manner and have really fine high notes and excellent technique. One of the greatest Marguerite de Valois to ever exist was none other than Joan Sutherland, who also sang this role at La Scala, at the Sydney Opera House, and even recorded this role alongside Martina Arroyo, Anastasio Sofrenos, and Gabriel Bacuillet. And there were also a lot of other coloratura sopranos who have embodied this role, and they had a great amount of success. Not only does this role call for a lot of high singing a la the Queen of the Night or Lucia Ashton, and to even some extent Constance, and even the likes of Aitra from Richard Strauss's Dear Tisha Helena, but she also needs a dramatic voice a la Norma from Bellini's Norma, Alaide from La Staraniera, Elvira from Ipuritani, Beatrice di Tenda, Anna Bolena, Maria Stuarda, Elisabetta from Roberto de Vere, Amalia from Masnadieri, Elvira from Hernani, Violetta from La Traviata, and Elena from I Vespri Siciliani. And she also needs to combine that with pure lyrical singing a la Louise from Charpentier's Louise, Antonia from Tales of Hoffman, and Magda from La Rondina. So you could definitely tell that this role is what I could easily consider one of the toughest roles for any dramatic coloratura soprano, not only because of the fact that she has to sing a lot of high notes, but also because she needs to have great acting skills and a great tambra to really bring this character to life. I've been following Patrizia Choffi's career for quite some time, and she's been specializing in a huge range of roles. She started out seeing a lot of the lyric coloratura soprano roles before eventually going straight into some of the dramatic coloratura soprano roles. She started off seeing roles like Blonde and Lisa from Entführung dem Israel and Sonambula respectively before singing roles like Lucia Ashton, Gilda, Violetta, Leila, Manon, and even the four heroines from Tales of Hoffman. And she does a very fine job in embodying this character. And there were also some interesting little quirks that she managed to put in for her cabaletta Asa du Anime, in which she sang the cadenza from Lucia de la Marmor and even a snippet of Olympia's 
dull song, which she added in for a really hilarious effect. And I thought she was able to have such great fun with this role. Yes, this role is quite dramatic, but the fact that you have someone like Madame Chaffee who is able to find some lighter moments within this role is quite something that was enjoyable, especially in the first act. She is a very gorgeous figure on stage and she cuts a very fine figure, especially when it comes to embodying this queen. Yes, there are times that her high notes do sound a little bit more on the shrill side and at times it may not sound like the greatest instrument one would ever listen to because whenever you think of Marguerite de Valois you'd automatically think singers like Joan Sutherland, Beverly Sills, or even Christiana Eda Pierre and many a true dramatic color tour soprano who would attempt this role but I still have to give credit to Madame Chaffee for everything that she had to pull off in terms of really bringing this role to life. It's not an easy job, but she does wonders with this role in her own special way, even though there were times her singing was a little bit on the shrill side. But regardless, her positives more than outweigh her negatives, as she was able to give off such a fine performance of this queen, and she did a very fine job all throughout. Singing the role of Valentina de saint brie was Olesya Golovneva. Valentina, as opposed to Marguerite de Valois, calls for a more dramatic soprano voice. Any voice who can combine the spinto nature of the Marshallin and Freya from Rosenkavir and the Strangold respectively to the more agile and dramatic singing of Abigail from Nabucco, Odabella from Attila, and Elisabetta from Maria Stuarda to even having a more dramatic soprano voice akin to Turando, Trisotemis, and Zenta, and even that hint of lyricism found in Tatiana from Eugene Onegin. The fact that this role is quite challenging for many a dramatic soprano is nonetheless quite rewarding, especially when it comes to her duet with Raoul in the fourth act. And there were also some mezzo-sopranos who even sang the role of Valentina due to the fact that this was composed for the original singer of Valentina, Marie Cornelia Falcon, in which the term Falcon is basically based on any singer who sings roles from either the soprano or mezzo repertoire, or just both. And in the German definition of the Falcon voice, it's basically known as Zwischenfach. And mezzos who have also sung this role included Giulietta Simonato, who sang this role alongside Joan Sutherland's Queen. And her duet with Franco Corelli as the Raoul is an example of how audiences would have felt the need to really see this production and not just hear this certain production of Huguenot at the time. And Olesya Golovneva is a very gorgeous figure on stage. I've also followed her career for quite some time, and what I've noticed about her is that she started out as a coloratura soprano, singing roles like the Queen of the Night and Constanza before heading to the more dramatic coloratura soprano repertoire like Violetta and Anna Bolena, and finally heading towards the more full lyric soprano repertoire like Mimi from La Boheme and some forays into the spinto soprano repertoire like Elisabetta from Don Carlo and Tatiana from Eugene Onegin. And while I really love the focus and clarity of her voice, it's really not my ideal voice for singing Valentina. Granted, she is a very great musician. She has superb musicianship, especially evidenced when she sings all of her notes. It's a clean attack on every single note she sings, and she sings with clarity, and she's just absolutely gorgeous on stage. But I would have loved to have a darker, heavier voice to sing a role like this, any soprano who has sung the likes of Crisotemis or Abigail or Odabella or even Elisabetta from Maria Stuarda. I would have loved any soprano to have sung this role. We could have had the likes of Alexandrina Pendachanska or Mary Elizabeth Williams, 
or even Emily McGee to even sing a role like Valentine du Sampli. But regardless, Olesya Golovneva really does a fantastic job in terms of her overall musicianship, and she was able to act the part wonderfully. She was able to make Valentina a very fragile character, but nonetheless has a lot of inner strength with her in order to move the plot along. She does a very fine job not only as a singer with a bright, focused, and really fine tone, but also as an actress as she was able to move around the stage in such a graceful manner and she did a very fine job with her solo aria, Parmi le Pleur, in which she sung with such pathos and such beauty. She did a very fine job in embodying Valentina du Sambri, even though I would have loved to have a heavier voice sing a role like this. Irene Roberts was a very charming Orbain. Orbain was originally composed for a lyric coloratura soprano, but in 1848, 12 years after the premiere of this opera, it was then reworked for a contralto. The first Orbain to sing this role in 1848 in the contralto line was Marietta Alboni, who was very well known in singing a lot of the roles from the bel canto repertoire. And nowadays, Urbain is mainly sung by mostly a mezzo, but there were a lot of sopranos who were able to have a crack at this wonderful page role as well. If you ask me, I always prefer Urbain to be sung by a lyric coloratura soprano to juxtapose between Marguerite de Valois' dramatic coloratura soprano voice and Valentin de saint more dramatic soprano voice. It just makes a huge and wonderful mixture of female voices. Any soprano who have sung the likes of Pamina, Gilda, Blonde, Melisande, Cerbinetta, Aminta from the Schweig Sommerfrau, Adina, Norina, Rosina, and even a lot of the roles of the lyric coloratura soprano repertoire have specialized as Urbain. Even a lot of the lyric mezzos who have specialized in roles like Isolier and Cenerentola have also specialized as Urbain. So much like his predecessor, Rosina, Urbain has been specialized by a lot of coloratura sopranos and coloratura mezzos the world over. And Irene Roberts did an amazing job in embodying Urbain. She has a very fine and gorgeous silken timbre, which she used very well. And she was able to sing all of her notes with such vivacity and charm. And she was an absolutely charming figure on stage. Granted, I would have loved to have a lyric coloratura soprano sing this role, but in terms of how Irene Roberts pulled it off, I thought she still managed to do a very wonderful job. She was able to be very charming, and her singing was absolutely well done. It's a very focused and fine high lyric mezzo instrument, and she has a very grand future ahead of her. Ante Yerkunitsa was a sterling Marcel. Marcel is usually given to any basso profondo. Any basso profondo who specialized in the likes of Titorel, Fafna, the Grand Inquisitor, Sparafucile, Osmin, Comendatore, Zarastro, and even roles like Hunding and Hagen have specialized as this really wonderful character. And what's also worth mentioning is that there were even some bassos like Cesare Sieppi who managed to even interpolate an extra low note in the final moments of Seigneur Rampal et Soutien, which some of them hit a low C, and Cesare Sieppi was one of the examples. So there has been no shortage of basso profondos who have specialized in this really wonderful part. What more can I say about Ante Erkunitsa? I've also followed his career for quite some time, ever since I first saw him at the Deutsche Oper Berlin as Alvise from La Gioconda. He has a very sturdy and sterling stage presence, and his vocal resources were infinite. He was able to make a great use of his basso profondo voice and his stage presence, as I said before, was very strong and handsome. He really knocked the pants off of this role with such a plomb 
that I was just so immersed in his portrayal of this really wonderful character. Derek Welton was a noble Comte de Saint-Bri. Now, unlike Marcel, who is given to a basso profondo, Le Comte de Saint-Bri is mostly given to a basso cantante or even a bass baritone. Any basso cantante who is specialized in the likes of Massimiliano from Masnadieri, Filippo from Don Carlo, Ramphis and the King from Aida, Silva from Ernani, Procida from I Vespri Siciliani, Fasolt from Das Rheingold, Heinrich der Vogler from Lohengrin, King Marke from Tristan und Isolde, Hans Sachs from Die Meistersinger von Nürnberg, and a lot of great roles for a basso cantante have specialized as this wonderful father figure. Even bass baritones who have specialized in roles like Boris Godunov and the Flying Dutchman have specialized as the Count as well. And my personal favorite bassos who have sung this role mainly range from the likes of Giorgio Tozzi and Manfred Schenk. Really wonderful basso voices who have specialized in a great amount of basso cantante and even basso profondo roles. And Derek Walton was just absolutely fabulous in this role. Granted, I would have loved to have a basso cantante to sing the role of Le Comte de saint -Bri, but I still have to give loads of credit to Mr. Welton in terms of his superb acting and in terms of his very grand stage presence, which he was able to bring into this particular character. Le Comte de Nevers was sung by Marc Barra, and you really need a dramatic baritone in order to embody a character like this. There's been no shortage of dramatic baritones and even cavalier baritones who have specialized in this role. Any baritone who has sung the roles of Nabucco, Telramund, Albrecht, Corvanal, Klingsor, Amfortas, and a lot of great roles for any dramatic baritone have specialized as Le Comte de Nevers. And I really love the timbre of Monsieur Barral's voice. It is a fine and rich timbre, and he has a very handsome stage presence. His bearing on stage was regal and elegant, but at the same time, very fierce in its own special way, which is also reflected in his singing, which is equally as fierce and just as handsome. He was able to sing all of his high notes with such clarity and precision, and he had a very lovely color all throughout. Juan Diego Flores was an absolute excitement as Rol de Nangy. Rol de Nangy really calls for a full lyric or spinto tenor with really great high notes. Much like his predecessor, Arnold from Guillantel, he not only needs to have those excellent high notes, but he also needs to have great technique as well, especially considering that he has some of the most challenging vocal lines in all of the tenor repertoire. He not only has to sing high, but he also has to sing floridly, he has to sing dramatically and lyrically, and he just needs to be a total stage actor from beginning to end, and he has to have a certain charm on stage which few other tenors could ever compare. Tenors who have sung this role have also went on to sing roles like Lohengrin, Loge from Das Rheingold, Walter von Stolzing, and even Andrea Chenier and Radames from Aida. And Juan Diego Flores was absolutely wonderful as Rol de Nangy. I've been following his career for quite some time and he has become one of my most favorite tenors of all time, mostly because of his superb musicianship. Once upon a time, Mr. Floreth basically specialized in a lot of the high singing bel canto roles, like the Count from Barbiere de Sevilla, but nowadays his focus has shifted to singing a lot more of the meteor roles, like Arnold from Guillantel, and of course, his recent engagement with Raoul from Les Huguenots. And I thought he pulled off this role with such grace, agility, and even hints of strength and nobility. He really knew how to pull this role off wonderfully, and he was an absolute vocal star on stage. There was not one vocal flaw that he had, and he sang his notes with such pure precision and great attacks on all the high notes, 
and he was just wonderful on stage, and he is just an absolute charmer from beginning to end. And don't be fooled by Bois Rosé's contribution on stage. Even though this role is quite small, it's nonetheless attracted a lot of light lyric tenors to embody this character. Heck, Richard Taube specialized in this role as well. And you really need a light lyric tenor who can not only sing high notes, but also juxtaposed between Roy Dunanchi's more spinto tenor voice, and Robert Watson was just absolutely fabulous as Bois Rosé. Even though his presence on stage was quite limited, his vocal resources and his stage presence were absolutely at their prime. He was just so wonderful in terms of his musicianship, and I really love the color of his voice. It is a round and rich lyric tenor instrument, and he just has a very strong stage presence and an equally grand future. The ensemble singing done by the Catholic noblemen consisting of Jörg Schirna as Cosse, John Carpenter as Meru, James Krischek as Tavant, Alexia Botnarschuch as both Torre and Moravier, and Tayu Uchiyama as Duretz was just so well done. Each of these gentlemen did wonderfully as they contributed absolutely great vocal resources, whether it be James Krischek's light lyric tenor voice, which sings wonderfully in terms of the high notes, Jörg Schirner's character tenor voice, Alexia Botmarschuch's rich basso voice, John Carpenter's youthful lyric baritone voice, and Tayu Uchiyama's more bass baritone voice, you could definitely tell that these guys really know how to pull it all together and make their ensemble singing something worth witnessing. Dong Huan Li's Night Watcher was just so well sung, especially considering the fact that he has a very wonderful timbre. And Abigail Levis and Adriana Ferfetska were absolutely charming as the ladies-in-waiting and the girls in the church. So overall, the singing was really well done from all sides of the border. Whether it be the main singers or the secondary singers, everyone was a pro in their own special ways. And the conducting done by Maestro Michele Mariotti was very well done. It was crisp and he had a great sense of musicianship as he really paid close attention to the text and what more can I say about the chorus of the Deutsche Oper Berlin, and especially that of the orchestra? Everyone was an absolute pro. So overall, this was definitely a wonderful evening for opera. No one was a disappointment, as everyone did wonderfully from beginning to end. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in later for my review of Blood Freak which is basically a horror movie from the 70s. And even though it's way past Thanksgiving, I still feel like I could put this movie in for a little bit of a review. So until then, have a great day, everybody.